I like your, your guys' background. Cool. Yeah. We, uh, surprised a lot of people don't do it. It's pretty easy. It's in the bottom, uh, to set it up, but, um, yeah, the alternative is just a green screen sitting behind us. So I don't really, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I got uh, my cool. exposed brick. In my yeah. I, well, I like yours. I like yours is more authentic. Mine's a little bit cheesy. <laughs> so, um, so everybody, thanks for, uh, for, for, uh, watching today. We are joined with, as a lot of people will recognize your face, not so much your beard, but your face, um, Chris Summers. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, the, the, this is what happens in pandemics. You, you grow beards and, you know. I'll be honest, I like growth. the beard. Keep, Thank keep you. the beard. That's my vote. My vote's keep the beard. I think, it, I think it's a good look. Um, but yeah, everybody was talking. The big, the big question right now under quarantine is, do I shave my hair or do I grow it out, right? That's what I've been hearing because it's like, <laughs> so you, you got one end covered completely. All good. Oh, good, man. So, Chris, I uh, I wanted to have you on today. You're, I've been pulling in a lot of um, market movers, players that are have unique perspectives, have been through cycles, and really can do a couple things in this, in that, like, not have everybody panic because they shouldn't be, you know, um, where you are in your business and what you're doing to adjust. And those are kind of the things, like, we've talked to, you know, McCann, Grav you know, we're kind of getting Alan Dahlman on here, Dan Zatowski. So guys that have like been around this, and I know you're one of them. We had done a video before and it was a good one. So if anybody hasn't seen that, they should, but you, and I, and I thought about this in my head today, but like you very specifically did some things during the last correction or cycle turn in 2008 that propelled you through 2008 and 2009. So we'll get into that in, in a little sure. bit, which I thought was unique, but talk to me, like, how have you been? What have you been doing? you know, what business, like what's going on in your world? Well, I mean, it's a really weird world in, and I'm sure everyone is experiencing this new normal and, and like how weird it is, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's bizarre because like some of these weeks, you know, post crisis or post shutdown, I've been busier than prior to the shutdown, you know, but it's busier doing different things. You know, obviously in our real estate world, like right now, in my opinion, obviously we're essential. We're hundred percent essential um, in everything that we do, but you know, per the state, you know, we're not. So people, you know, can't show homes. Yeah. You know, we can't do open houses, but we could do a lot of other things. So I think the agents that are working remotely and are doubling down on what they can do is really going to make them that much more powerful in position, you know, when this turns, I like the kind of the quote, you know, prepare for the worst, you know, but hope for the best. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for all of us doing all these Zoom calls, doubling down on education, be more positioned with uh, virtual tours for their listings, you know, whatever it might be, is going to help people kind of, you know, be that better agent or better company. I think companies in and of themselves, like mortgage companies, title companies, and brokers, this is like a fast learning curve opportunity, you know, to get better at a lot of different things and companies, you know, can evolve in a short period of time, you know, where they don't really have a choice to make things work for the settlements that are in process that will be in process and not for nothing things could be that much more efficient and streamlined, you know, in the future. I like what you're, I like what you're saying with that. And a lot of the, you know, so we've had a lot of successful people on here so far over the past several weeks and, every one of them seems to have a common theme, whether they're in the mortgage industry, investment industry, you know, retail sales industry, they're all saying exactly what you're saying. You're like, first they're saying, I don't understand it, but I'm more busy than I was, you know, right. Just prior to this. And I, I'm right. having the same thing too. Ryan's having the same thing. It just business is doing whatever, like we're all adapting to this new norm and then saying, this is how we move forward. So obviously zoom calls are huge, you know, educating yourself is a big one. I'm sure you're with like KW, you know, zoom meetings all the time. But like, what are some differences that you think are going to make or break, you know, like what you're going to do through this that somebody else may not do through this or your competition may not do through this um, due to like discipline or things you've learned in the past cycles? Because you did some really cool things in our prior video that uh, from the 2008 cycle that you could you touch on or I'll touch on for you. But, you know, what are you going to be doing to separate yourself to come out of here like, a, you know, out of a cannon? All right. Yeah. I kind of cut off there for a second. I guess the question is, you know, what can you do or what should you be doing or the top two or three things now 
versus prior. Was that the question? That's good. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, you know, client service sales 101, you know, is staying in contact you know, with the people that you're working with currently. And I think, you know, it's not that difficult you know, to, to make a phone call. This should have been done already, you know, but yeah, hey, you know, we're working, we're available. If you have any questions, you know, let me know. You know, there might be something that I might not exactly know what the answer is, but I can get it, you know, very quickly, um, number one. Number two, you know, we, we kind of talk about, you know, over the years, how important a database is for an agent's business. You know, obviously that's the people they're working with now, but a potential pipeline for the future or, or past clients. And I think this is the opportunity you know, for agents to really kind of build that daily habit, you know, of staying in contact with people, you know, maybe it's prospecting, you know, building that pipeline, same kind of thing. Hey, I'm available, you know, or for all your past clients, it might be not for nothing. Have you contacted your past loan officer? If not, maybe you should get Ian Walsh or someone to call, look into a refi. You know, it's not as much a sale in, in a business for a realtor right now, yeah, but these are added value types of things that that provides a really nice touch point to you know to to make contact with a past client. Like we did a video of um, Alan Nachmanson recently. Yeah, you know, how landlords should prepare for April and COVID. You know, because obviously on the news they're basically saying, hey, if you're renting, don't send in your rent check. Well, what if that person still has their job? Um, you know, so. Yeah, not for nothing, knock on wood, most of my rent checks have come in, you know, for April, you know, one or two, like we'll work with, you know, if, if, if there is, you know, some issues. So I think that's the third thing. What information can you put together, you know, that's relevant, that's timely, that's not just new listing ABC, you know, but hey, this is how you should prepare as a landlord. Or hey, if you're thinking about buying a home, even though prices might dip a tad, you know, getting this super interest rate here gives you like a huge cushion, you know, for when things, you know, go the other way, you know, so there's lots of things I think that, that people can kind of do now to kind of build their brand, be more positioned, be more, you know, of a high level information source, because over time, people remember that. And not for nothing, I, I think I recall that video that we did, Ian, and back in that financial crisis, that's what you know, Stephanie and I did. We did a lot of blogging. We did a lot of sharing info. You know, should I list now or wait until spring? There's a blog that got like tons of, uh, of views. You know, is that's what people can do now. Also, you know, the, the content or the platforms are, are a little bit different. Instagram wasn't available back then and, you know, other mediums weren't available. Yeah, you know, but now video and whatnot. Yeah, it was there, but yeah, that's the opportunity where I think people can kind of position themselves to be more that trusted agent because when things turn, in my mind, I think, you know, that seller or that buyer now might not go to the family friend as the realtor, now might not go to that part time agent, you know, where the market is just kind of doing its thing, you know, not a lot of concern or worry you know, where, you know, now marketing becomes more important again for sellers and buyers. You need to have someone that's really kind of positioned in the market that kind of, you know, we have agents on our team that are now doing Zoom videos for buyer consultations. How cool is that? Give me, yeah, that's actually a really innovative idea. Give me like a, give me like an overview of how that goes. Like, so buyer consultation, I would say I'm a buyer, like, Hey, Chris, I'm thinking about buying some properties in Philly. Like, you know, how does that, how does that meeting go? Well, I mean, I think in the past, like, Hey, we would have a phone call. I would get your info. I would send you some listings. Okay. And that's cool. And that still works. Yeah. But if we haven't met yet, why not do something a little bit more personal? Or even if we have met, yeah, you know, pop on a zoom call, have coffee, Yeah, you know, maybe it's cocktail in the evening and really take the time to go through the buying process, utilize screen share. You could have, you know, available listings in the background. Hey, this is what's available in Fishtown. This is what's available in Queen Village or whatever it is that they're looking for. And then have kind of like that face-to-face -face Q&A with whatever their questions are and then kind of lead to the next step. Now people, you know, oftentimes would have that buyer consultation in the office. 
and that works too. But fast forward post crisis, I think people can be more efficient with their time instead of always having a buyer consultation in the office. Why not have it on a Zoom call? Or if you're writing an offer, hey, you know, it's you can kind of have. I think it just makes the process a more efficient, more relevant, and see that that client experience starts to become a little bit better, yeah, you know, because they're having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with with whoever they're working with. Yeah, let's let's be honest. We all want to. I mean, it's about time now. Real estate's going to come around and be do what Amazon did. We all want to sit at our computer from home and get as much information as we can and have that experience to then shop. And real estate's just another version of shopping and what kind of deal you want to get and so forth. So I think this process potentially will change. We might look back in like 10 years or five years or even a year and say, remember when that you know, virus changed the way we do real estate? To, you know, I think this Zoom thing could extend it much further because I think people are realizing they can get the same thing accomplished without cutting out half their day, going to the office, doing all this stuff. And you can get it done within an hour, Zoom meeting with your agent, bang, buyer or seller side, buyer side, you're the first person to mention the buyer side, which I think is a great idea because I'm going to be sharing, I'd rather share you my comps rather than printing a bunch of them out anyway and saying, oh, I forgot some of the comps. Like I can go through my screen with you and say, this is where we are. So I think I think the future of real estate and consultations is here. And I think people will get very efficient at selling more real estate because they can also do more appointments on a given day, potentially even group appointments. You know, you might have three or four buyers in an area that you want to give like a presentation to, and you can, you don't have to coordinate that and have an assistant do this and that you bang, you have it right down in zoom. So you yeah. guys are pushing that, pushing that boundary, which is great. Yeah. I think there's just, I mean, it becomes kind of limitless in terms of what, what you can do, but still keep it simple at the same time. And I know we're talking about, you know, realtors, but like, yeah, you know, even in the last year, I won't call out any title companies or, or mortgage companies, but like, like why in the past have I been at settlements for two hours, two and a half hours, you know, the title person disappears. I don't know where they go. You know, the mortgage stuff is like all over the place. And, you know, oftentimes as a listing agent, I might get there fashionably late. I'll tell my sellers, well, hey, let's get there 15, 30 minutes later. You know, and now think about this, like there's a lot of settlements that are being done right now. You know, the mortgage package is, 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 is paperless. Title companies are adopting to that a little bit more. They don't have a choice. You know, so mortgage and title is making it that much, much more streamlined. You know, so who ultimately is winning here? It's not just a realtor. It makes that client experience, you know, that much better. So I think it's an opportunity, you know, for every aspect of the transaction and the players involved to kind of step up their game and evolve a little bit. Interesting. You mentioned the uh, title companies. I was having probably for the last six months, and I won't call out any particular companies either, but like I ran into specifically difficult closings for no reason, just competency issues and, and efficiency issues since this has happened all of a sudden the cream has risen to the top. I don't know if this has been your experience, but the closings that I've been having, like since like all of a sudden title companies realized we don't have all this business just floating in the door. I have had some really great title company experiences in terms of follow-up, efficiency, closing, like, you know, punctuality, responsiveness. It's all through yeah. the roof. I don't know yeah. if you've been experiencing that, but I've been loving it from where I sit. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that again, that that's the opportunity. And then like, you know, with our opportunity, like, you know, as like, you know, I'm, you know, the team leader, I've, I have a large team, you know, and we were um, having like, we have our sales rally calls, like, you know, once, once, a, you know, once a week, and we're doing them on zoom, you know, but as soon as the crisis hit, you know, we stepped it up to three times a week. So, you know, we do a Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning, you know, it's a great opportunity, you know, for the people to kind of, you know, share their experiences with the transactions that are happening now, because there is a lot of logistical issues. Um, yeah, but you know, working through them, you know, what objections might be coming up, you know, how to handle them. You know, sometimes, you know, yeah, a deal might not happen. A buyer loses their job. All right. The mortgage doesn't go through. Things happen. But I think the important thing now, you know, for agents is, you know, to have the right mindset to deal with, you know, whatever's happening and have the action steps to continue to do what's necessary, you know, to build their business, you know, the right way. And I think if anything, this whole process provides the opportunity you know, for someone to kind of drill down. Hey, this is, you know, I think we all got like a little bit lazy 
you know, in the last year or two, it's hard not to get lazy when, when a market's been so good. You know, you put a listing on, you know, you get three offers, like the marketing's not as important, you know, to them. I mean, it's still important. Yeah. But again, this is an opportunity for people to step up their game and to instill some of those, you know, daily habits that will you know, be that much more effective, you know, in, in a good market, bad market. The bad market is obviously where it's that much more relevant to, you know, for someone to step up their game. Yeah. I mean, I think riding off of that and what you were saying before on, on your action steps on what we can do right now, which is touching base with your clients and uh, maintaining your database. I mean, really what you're saying is that whether we like it or not, there's a massive reset happening right now. The race is starting over. Uh, this could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on where you were. And what I mean by race, I mean saying we're all in the same boat, right? So if you're an agent, everyone is forced to be inside right now. You need to groom and, and create all your habits. So even though what you're saying may seem, uh, I don't know, basic to, to, to some people, but really what you're doing is you are putting yourself on, on the starting gate, ready to go. Because as soon as that gate opens up by doing these habits, by staying in touch with your clients and contacting them and ma maintaining your, your database, you're going to be the first one out of that gate. And again, just how you did in the previous cycle, you will be leading the pack. Whereas anyone right now who's saying, ah, I don't need to do that because when, when things open up again, everything's going to come my way. You are now behind everyone who is doing that right from the start and you're trailing. So those basic items of stay, staying in touch with your, your customers are so important right now. And, and I just, you know, thanks for sharing that info for all of us to, to have, because that's how you get ahead for when the gates open up here. Um, I think that was awesome. Info you yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're so right there, Ryan. And I think it goes one step further because what happens is, you know, certain consumers, buyers and sellers, future buyers, sellers, they might be working or have worked with someone in the past, but, if there's another relationship that starts to grow you know, because they see this or they reach out to someone else for a question and they start to get some client service, well, in these types of markets, and every, for every new relationship that happens with a realtor and a potential client is likely a relationship lost for someone else. So maybe they had some business, but there's no guarantee that, that it's gonna come back and then there's no guarantee that that referral business might be there either. So it really starts to compound, compound itself. And, you know, like I hear like a lot of realtors, like, you know, filing for unemployment, like why, you know, like there is business that, that could be done right now. And Hey, I mean, if, if you have to file for, for unemployment, fine. I mean, by all means, you got to do what you got to do. But like, I'm looking at us, like we have settlements in April, um, a lot. We have settlements in May. You know, some in June, like I'm not filing for unemployment. And obviously the, the PPE, you know, is, is the, or the PPP, I think for small businesses is, is appropriate, but yeah, may, not everyone might be in, in those shoes, but like, why wouldn't they? Because this is the spring market, you know, where properties went under contract in February and March and whatnot. Um, and then what happens now to fast forward, you know, we're in this pause you know, where people aren't having as, as much revenue. And if they're continuing the pause and not doing exactly what we're talking about, well, then their business for June, July, and August is going to be very low too, you know? That's, and that's that, right. the I, 90 I think day, The 90 day real estate theory, right? Correct. Everything yeah. you do now comes up in 90 days from now. And it's, if anything, during times like this, it's compounded. So everything you do today doubles in 90 days, right? Right. So yeah, it's, it's so important to capture that. Yeah, I don't think that the, uh, the, the, the success or lack of success is ever a mystery for the effort put in. So, you know, directly the energy correlated and the efficiency of what you do today will show up in 90 days. So like, you know, I always used to think, and when I was building, you know, original business was like, this would happen to me all the time. I would get, in, you get into your own like mini cycles where, you know, you don't market for 30 or 60 days and then 30 and then so then 60 or 120 days from that point, you go, man, I really need leads. Why am, why are no leads coming in? And you're not, you know, until you connect the dots that what you did 60 days ago was what Correct. you're seeing right now. And it's hard and it sounds easy, but it's hard being in the business to like realize that that's what's happening. Just like, you know, so whatever that energy is today. And like you said, like if you pause now, that pause isn't going to show up. I mean, it'll show up by lack of income now, 
but it really shows up in July and August when other people are, you're like, wow, how are they doing so well? And I'm not doing what, well, you know, it's because you paused, you can't pause right now and you need to do what you did in 2008, which, you know, and this is something that stuck with me during our meeting um, for you. Cause I think I pay attention. I, like, I don't just do these, I, these, these I meetings. Either. Yeah. I pay attention to you. I pay attention to different people for different reasons. And you, very specifically said, you know, you, when everybody else was cutting back on their marketing, you were doubling down and tripling down in 2008. And then lo and behold, here's Chris Summers. Everybody knows who Chris Summers is now, but you know, it wasn't like that happened overnight. And it was because of a very against the grain decision you had to make in the face of a time that seemed crazy. And right now I'm seeing, I'm talking to people that are cutting expenses and they mentioned cutting marketing. And I'm like, oh no, Chris Summers wouldn't agree with that, you know, or some of the other guys said the same thing. So can you talk about like your mindset with that, you know, as the foundational premise of where we are during this shift right now? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And obviously I think, you know, I'll throw out, um, you know, cause I am at Keller Williams now, I'll, I'll give the shout out you know, to, to KW, but you don't have to be a KW agent to read the book shift. Um, and the book shift is like a playbook of what to do when the market shifts, you know, and kind of like everything we're talking about right now and, and things that anyone are talking about is in that book. And I'm kind of using it as an outline, um, you know, in my sales rally calls. And, and one of the, the tactics and one of the chapters is obviously really drill down, you know, to, to your expenses, which gets back to the question. And I think in up markets, yeah, there could be a lot of fluff marketing type expenses you know i won't mention any names like zillow or anything that you know or anything like that that you know what it's good you know and and things can come from that but then it's an opportunity for every business owner to kind of drill down hey i spent this on this you know try to quantify what the roi is um and and make some changes and but you're right like if you scale back and don't do anything well that's really going to hurt so i think kind of what we're doing is really kind of what we're what you're doing right now with this video, Ian. Yeah, you know, like when I did that video with Alan Nachmanson, you know, that we share with the landlords, you know, about what to prepare for. Well, how much money did that cost? Yeah, you know, my marketing person, you know, a couple hours worth of work to kind of you know put the video together. I'm not as high tech as people might you know think I am, um, you know, but I got the basics. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's really more time and effort to put things together and then kind of share them with your database. And so that, that example there really didn't cost that much, hardly anything. So I think you know, if people kind of get back to, to basics with doing some content or generating some content organically, you know, whether it's a video, a Zoom video, I've gone on Instagram Live recently with a couple of local lenders to kind of talk about, hey, what's happening with interest rates, what's happening with paperless closings. And that kind of gets back to, what we did back in the financial crisis. Yeah, we doubled down in marketing, Ian, but a lot of that was really our own time. It takes a lot of time to write a blog. It takes a lot of time to like do a video and share it, but does the expense really grow that much? It, to a certain extent, it's your time and your time is valuable and you can't like do too much and not prospect. So I think you have the combination of prospecting and marketing, but you need some of the marketing stuff to prospect. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg kind of thing, but I think the doubling down kind of thing could be your time, your effort, your energy, be innovative, be creative. You know, what can we do to stand out from the crowd? And it doesn't always necessarily have to mean, you know, writing checks, you know, to have that go up. Now, if something's really starting to work and you're writing some checks or, you know, whatever it might be, well, yeah, I mean, by all means, that's something you want to keep doing. Does that kind of answer your question a little bit? Yeah, I, I think. Oh, go ahead, Ray. I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's not about spending more money. It's not exactly what we're saying. We're saying all of your thought and your focus of your mind, like how do we get creative here with our marketing is what your focus should be right now. We're not necessarily saying spend more. If you do find something, like you said, that is financially, you know, makes sense to spend, then do it. But I mean, these videos, Every day, we're, we're literally practicing what we're preaching right now. Right. Uh, you know, we're doing, doing this for multiple reasons. One, to help educate everyone in the market, you know, get, get input from people such as yourself. But, you know, look at our background, you know. Um, you know, we're, it's creative. 
it was something we thought of like saying like how, how do we do this it didn't cost us money to put this in our background it didn't cost us money yes we're putting time in like you said time and energy and, and that's that's what focusing on marketing really means in times like this so i i think everything to, you said was yeah. spot on and today, like, you know, if you, if you go back, you, you touched on something in the very beginning, Chris, which was, you know, hey, 10 years ago, we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have this. So I was blogging and you were making, you know, you, it caught fire. And, you know, this is just modern day. This is just 10 years ago with blogging version, which is video blogging. That's what we're doing, you know, in essence. And um, really, that's what that's what we're leveraging. And like Ryan said, it's not about spending more money. I'm not going out and buying commercials on TV, to, you know, $5,000 or $10,000 a month. I'm just making sure that my daily energy isn't spent on any, you know, it is spent marketing right now. Yeah. And, it's, um, yeah, yeah. Being productive, productive with your time. And I could kind of reverse the switch a little bit. You know, like I know tons of mortgage people. Yeah. They're always, you know, contacting me and yeah. Hey, you know, and, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's cool. Yeah. But I, I have, you know, some preferred lenders that we work with as a team. Um, but my point being is like, I know a lot of hard money guys. Um, and, you know, it's not too often that we have someone that, that is looking for a hard money you know, type deal, but when and if they do, nine times out of 10, I'm, I'm telling them to call Ian, because why? It's more so because top of mind, doing a video like this today, doing like a video with you in the past, you're top of mind when I think of hard money. Now I know other guys you know, that are hard money and, and they would do great work, you know, but that's not the first person I think of. And I think that's the same thing with realtors, you know, with what they're doing. Yeah, you know, people always kind of say, you know, that, you know, Chris Summers, you know, Fishtown, South Kensington and North Liberties, which sometimes I don't like to be pigeonholed for those areas. Like we do business uh, all shoot. over the- <laughs> I all over the, people, I get Fishtown and I go, go to Chris Summers team. That's what I tell and, and that's perfect. I, I love it, you know, you know, because sometimes I might, you know, sell something in South Philly or you only do Fishtown. I'm like, no, we do all over the city. But I think- I love being top of mind for Fishtown and South Kansas and Northern Liberties because I think over the years, why? You know, we've had, you know, so much content talking about neighborhood updates, talking about, you know, having video updates. And I try not to be like too spammy on social media, you know, new listing ABC. Not everyone cares about new listing ABC. Um, yeah, but people like looking at videos. They like looking at photos. They like knowing what's going on with the market or maybe it's uh you know, some restaurant updates or whatever, because we're, you know, we're always, you know, kind of around in these areas. I lived in Northern Liberties, you know, for well over a decade. Now I live a little bit more in the hood, you know, in South Kensington, close to North Square, which I think is cool because that's where, you know, more development is happening now. But I think it's, 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 a, it's a perfect parallel example of the more you put out there, you know, the more people see it and, and you kind of become more of a trusted advisor because you are, like you are living whether it's you know your your work as a hard money guy or with us you know selling a lot of properties and being involved in in these neighborhoods and communities on many different fronts besides <clears throat> you know just selling homes yeah i mean i'd say we subscribe to the same exact theory you know our our marketing isn't look at our rates look at look at how much money you can save no we we market by providing education and and value to people and a lot of it doesn't even come across as marketing right um because people just would see a post from us and, they, you know, they'd say, oh, cool. And, and now all of a sudden we're top of mind, like you said, right? Like it's in, in our opinion, it's a form of better marketing than just plastering, you know, a new listing, right? Correct. It's, it's, uh, it's you, because it's back to that 90 day concept when somebody's going to come back to thinking about needing your service all of a sudden, they're not going to remember that listing that you'd put up 90 days, but they will remember that you were the person who gave them some education and they can trust you and your name comes to the top of mind just like that. And they, they give you that call back. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. I think about like something we always joke about internally is that, you know, when our competitors would put out, uh, you know, XYZ company just funded, a, you know, this $10 million deal, like that gives the, the person reading it zero value. It's, it's, it's lazy marketing. It's when like what I find, what we've found is that, you know, there's zero effort into doing that. I could just, I could, sure, I could just tell everybody how many deals I'm doing and great, all this, you know, but like that doesn't give, the whole point of it isn't to boast my own ego. The point of it is to hopefully somebody can pick something out of the 
you know, the conversation we're having that adds value. And then the top of mind is because like you just said, Chris, you're a trusted advisor in your space because you are like you live it, you live it every day. And there's a reason that you've earned the right to be looked at in that capacity, you know, depending on who you're dealing with. Some people are certainly more savvy than I am, but you know, a lot of people that, that need, need to know that kind of stuff, my value of like my knowledge that I've experienced should be in front of you, not how many deals I do or, or whatever. Yeah. It be. Like it's just not, just right. not the same kind of value. Yeah. I mean, I think to a certain degree, you know, consumers you know, are looking for that combination of both. Obviously they want, you know, experience. Yeah. You know, but with that, yeah, they want, you know, someone that they can connect with, you know, it's genuine. Sometimes they, this happens to me frequently where, you know, I'll meet with someone. I don't, don't know exactly you know, where they kind of met me, but, but then they'll be like, Oh yeah, I was on your YouTube channel or, you know, I saw a video or I've been following your, your posts, you know, for years. And then you meet them face to face. So like, you know, I feel like, you know, I know you so well already. And I think that just kind of just gets back to being, you know, genuine. Now, you know, sometimes people have an online persona that's different than offline. That doesn't work, you know, or you know, flip side. So when it all kind of comes together, yeah, you know, then people, I think, kind of get the best of both worlds. They get expertise, they get experience in addition to someone, you know, they trust, they know, they feel like that, that that's going to help them and they will. You know, versus, you know, someone's, oh, yeah, I'm a hundred million dollar producer. Well, well, so what? You know, I mean, that's cool and that there's value to that, you know, but the combine the both, I think, takes it one step further, you know, which allows for, you know, future business, you know, down the road. Yeah, I need to step back on my comment because you're right. You're like, I, I guess I look at it as like, you kind of put the, it's like putting a degree on the wall, being like, all right, I'm a hundred million dollar producer, right? That's all we need to say about that. And then you move forward into, you know, what you know and what you do. And then it goes, and then you kind of go, oh, well, it makes sense why he's a hundred million dollar producer because of this, like what he brings to the table. So you're right in the fact that I can't, you know, there's people that run around saying they know all this stuff and do all this stuff and they do, you know, one or two deals a year and you go, you know, how much experience do you really have? So, right, right. so it's like a little credential or like a little, you know, it is, but it's, a, but, it's a, but it's necessary. Like, did you go to Harvard? <laughs> you know, did you not whatever, you know, line of work you're in? And that's kind of your, you know, thing. You don't rely on that so much as it's just part of your, you know, line. So I think it's right. a really good point. So I need to back up on that statement because I do that too. I'll say like, you know, we deploy 40 million a year or whatever it may be. And that's, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't go into much further than yeah, that. Yeah. It's a little, you know, chicken and egg kind of thing, but I think, yeah. you know, I was just reading a book, I think it was called The Go-Giver. Um, okay. And, you know, it kind of really talks about, you know, leadership and leadership you know, the best example is, you know, is leading by example, you know, and not having, you know, vanity, you know, what's best, you know, for Chris Summers, you know, it's really what's best, you know, for the client or for the bigger picture, the more you give, the more you receive and the more successful you can become from that. So you have a little bit of that, that paradox that, that can kind of kick in. So I, um, Chris, any, so I, your, your conversations are always thought provoking. You're very like, you've got a different level to you that a lot of people that, you know, I talk to don't, um, there's layers. You think about it. You're an in-depth, in-depth thinking kind of guy. So I always like enjoy the conversation. And I'll think back on a lot of this as well, but did you have anything that you wanted to tell people or leave, what, what, what parting words would you leave? Cause you have people on your team that are maybe new. You have people that are experienced people that haven't been through a cycle, Anything you would say to people out there about this moment in time? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, take advantage of the time. Like, I, yeah, so I'm not perfect all the time, Ian. I procrastinate. I have a nice new car outside. Uh, you know, it, it's needed service for like months. I even have a reminder, you know, you're three months overdue. You know, so I finally got a service and it wasn't that difficult. They came, they picked it up, they brought it back. Um, so I, I guess now is really an opportunity for people to like get a lot of things done on your to-do list that maybe you've been procrastinating on, number one. You know, number two, you have this extra time to dive in and do more things to sharpen your skills. You know, get on Zoom, double down on training. You know, the, the KW training, it's like, it's so much, it's insane. You know, but if the people that are kind of really diving in on that, I know, including myself, are going to be that much better down the road. I always preached about 10 pages a day. You probably heard me talk about this before. You know, if you read 10 pages a day, how difficult is that? I have 100 books right in front of me. You can't see my bookshelf. 
Yeah, but if you read 10 pages a day over 30 days, yeah, that's at least one book. And over a course of the year, that's 12 books. So if someone hasn't read They Can Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, Shift by Gary Keller, Relentless, these, the, these lists goes on and on. You know, why not do that now? Um, and if you're a Kindle person or audio, audible person, we'll do that. So you, I, I think the opportunity for people to really amp up their self-development and their daily habits to really have that in gear for when this does turn, you know, not only makes them better today, it'll make them better tomorrow too. Long answer to your question. That was a really good. That was a really good parting speech. I'm gonna leave it at that. That was good. I like it. I, it was, I was inspired. I'm inspired to go pick up an audio book right now. So, Chris, I thank you, man. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch. And if you need anything from me, and obviously if anybody needs anything, and not just Fishtown, <laughs> but right, if yeah, you need all, any, all, all over, all over the city. all over Philly. Chris is a good yeah. guy. He's been around a long time. He is an expert for sure in the field, and that's why we have him on. So, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, you guys. Kick some ass. I hope that's okay to say that. All right. Take care.